we are recording. All right, so well, it's not the best screen in the world, but this will also be recorded and posted on the YouTube site. So if you need to come back and revisit it, uh, it's recording my screen, which is much clearer than that up there. So um, what I've done is I essentially put an R project on the Moodle site for you. So if you go down to this week, you'll see that this is the 17th of February. These are lab materials. If you click on that, you'll see that there's a little icon down here that says Vigilance. So what an R project is, is it's just a way of organizing stuff within R so that all of your stuff is kind of in a compact package and it's got a file structure associated with it, et cetera. And I'll show you what that structure looks like here in a few minutes. But the nice thing about it is it enables you to transport R projects from computer to computer without having to worry about changing the root directory structure and all that stuff, which oftentimes gives people problems. So you should be able to just download this. When you download it, you should just be able to open it. And oh, there it is in my downloads. And when you click on it, you'll see that it has reports, data, scripts, et cetera, et cetera. Inside the data section, the files are already there. And inside the script section, the vigilance file is already there. So if you download it, it's now in your downloads folder. I wouldn't leave it in your downloads folder. I would maybe drag it to your animal behavior folder. So I'm going to put it in my animal behavior folder. And I'm just going to, I don't have a, I don't have a folder for lab stuff, so I'm just going to drop it anywhere in there. Now, what we should be able to do is just go to R and open up R. And when you open up R, it's going to open the last thing that I did, which unfortunately was the vigilance, the vigilance file. So I'm going to just get rid of everything in R. So what you should be able to do is go up to File, Open, open project. And when you go to open project, it will allow you to navigate to wherever that project is. And my project is in my animal behavior file. And there it is. And when you open it up, it should open up a new version of R, a new, a new, yeah, a new, a new window of R. And what you should see in this is you should see in the upper left hand corner is your editing frame. In the lower right hand corner, it should open up automatically to files and you should see that the files are all here. The folders are all here. When you click on data, you should see both of those two data files. So I gave you a workbook that had a sheet in it for focal animal sampling and a sheet in it for, for scan sampling. And I just divided those things up into two separate CSV files. So this is also something new to you, which this is an R markdown file. What an R markdown file does is it allows you to do things in R where you can write a bunch of comments without having to comment them out using the hashtag, the, the pound sign. And the other thing that R markdown does for you is it enables you to produce a report out of it. And I'll show you how that works at the end. But other than that, the R markdown file is, is basically really similar to R. All of you have some experience with R, but maybe not as much experience as other people do. So in the gray areas here, you can see there's a gray section right there. That's what's called a code chunk. A code chunk is just a little chunk of, of R scripting. And when you run that, you can just put your, your cursor in there, or you can hit the button here and, and run it, and it'll just run it. And then there's a bunch of, of text. So in this case, the first thing that you need to do in R is you need to load packages. And in order to run R Markdown, one of the first things that you need to do is you need to have R Markdown as one of the packages. So are you guys following along in doing this or not? No, I can't get the package open. You can't? It doesn't have like, the stuff in the top left box. OK. I also can't get it to download on my computer. It says that it's not in a supported form. And I don't know how to change it. Oh, that's weird. Do you have R on your computer? Like 
close that, right click on your joint, and click, is there a download? Is there a download option? There's not a download option. There's not a download option. Go to download folder on Google. There you go. Now, it's going to be within that folder. You'll have to get it out of that folder. So what was your issue? Um, there's nothing in this box. Cool. And I thought I opened it. Did you open it as a project? Yeah, I went to file. Open project. And then I should just open it, right? What? Oops, sorry. I didn't mean to click open. That's how it's to do that. Okay. I'll show you where you might mess up. Go ahead. Click on your joints. Open that. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, because right. I, I tried to like do it. Go to scripts. The vigilance R and D sits with that map machine. Okay. Right. Thank you. Avery. What's your issue? I don't know. I don't know how to open the project. It's like not popping up. What's that? The project isn't popping up. I have it in this folder. And that is zipped. So the first thing you need to do is you need to unzip it. So go go back to where it was in your directory. See that thing there? It doesn't need to zip. So right click on it. Oh yeah, there it is. So you take that out. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then go to R and open that wherever it's hanging out. Which is in your old applied stats folder. Yeah. <laughs> they just need nice. Wait, nope. Go back. Just click on that. Yep, open it. <laughs> hey, cut it out. Click open again. There's also that other folder, I don't know if that matters or not. What other folder? The, go back to the original thing. Should be. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I saw it. It's just a map for us thing. I'm not sure. I could open it like that, but then I can't see um, that stuff. Because you opened it from within a project and kept the, the project structure. Mine's still uh, okay. okay, let me see where it's at. Um, even if I just download it, okay. and it goes into my download. Okay, how many copies do you now have on your computer? A lot. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's look at it. Right click on on the on the vigilance folder. Yeah, either one, any of those should work. Um, go to open with. Go to other. Go to applications. R, wait, where? Oh, but you don't have our studio. I do. I do, it's right here. Oh, oh, no. Sometimes you have to. Thank you. 
It appears it's colder. Right, that's what I was thinking. This is the, well that's the zip file for the folder. I don't want to add zips into the other zips that I have now. Follow along with us. When we're done, I'll try to figure out what to do with the maybe give it to you on the flash drive. Okay. Do you have the ability to use yeah. the flash drive? Yeah. Alright, All right. so yeah, just try and hang with us as, as best you can. I'm not sure why it's doing that. Okay. So um what was I saying? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know I don't either. Okay. So, so anyway, there's already a structure to it. So um, the first thing that you're going to need to have loaded is our markdown. So if you go over to packages over here, you can click on install. You can actually just type our mark and it'll give you a little drop down menu, our markdown. And if you don't have our markdown installed, go ahead and install that. The other thing that you are going to need to install is Pac-Man. And once again, install that. Once you have installed it, then you need to go down here and you need to load Pac-Man. And what Pac-Man is, is Pac-Man is just a package that somebody built that allows you to load all of your packages that you need for a project all at once. And the cool thing about Pac-Man is that if you ask it to load a package and it happens to be a package that's not installed on your computer, it will install it automatically for you. Also, as it's opening your packages, basically loading your packages, if it discovers that one of your packages is out of date, it will automatically update it. And so it's a nice little, little envelope of, of, of functionality. So when you load Pac-Man, you can then load RMISC, ggplot, and car, and it doesn't matter if those aren't on your computer, it'll just, it'll just install them for you. So it may take a couple of minutes because it's gonna go through the installation process, but just, just wait on it. Let me know when, when those of you who have functionality are done, have, have everything loaded. When you've done that, you can use the command p underscore loaded with open parentheses, and that will tell you which packages you have loaded. And in this case, we loaded car, ggplot, and rmisc, and pacman, because we wanted to have pacman. But in the process of loading car, we needed to load car data. And in the process of loading our misc, we also needed plier and lattice and some other things. And so it loaded all of the packages that you asked it to, and it also loaded all of the packages that those packages depend upon to, to function correctly. <clears throat> so that's the nice thing about Pac-Man. Plus it was a great video game console from the 1980s. So are we all here together? Okay, cool. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to load the data. So in R, we always do this with the read.csv. The file that you have is in the folder data already. And you notice that there's no other, there's no other path. And that's because you're working within the project directory. So all you need to do is reference that in your path. So you know that the data focal is in the data folder. So all you really need is data forward slash focal.csv. And I'm calling this data file focal just to keep myself straight between focal sampling, focal animal sampling and scan sampling. And when you do that, you can then run head focal and it'll give you the, the head of your data file, the first six values. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. What is the nature of the error? Oh. 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 Oh.
<laughs> this is my punishment? Yeah. Okay, all right. So what I did was, so let, let me see if it works. For whatever reason, I can't seem to talk in this way. I'm trying to talk in this path. Let's see. And I'm trying to paste it in here. Let's see. Why does it do that? Why does it, oh, oh, because that's the, that's your, I, that's your path. So let's look that up. Boom. Yeah, so when you click on iCloud Drive, that, so in your path, when you go and get info on the, on the file, it says iCloud, but then iCloud expands to that whole big thing. So anyway, so we just put the path in there. Um, I'm guessing, are you working on the cloud also? No. Uh, you find your, um, find your data file on your, in your cloud directory? On your computer. Where did you put it? Oh yeah. Okay. It's in your data directory, so I'm just gonna get and click. Um, how do you write the click on your computer? Thank you. Properties. I already just have to shift my brain. Mm -hmm.
unfortunately. Yeah. We have to do this. If it doesn't like that, we have to mm -hmm. do this. general like you know computers are computers oh no you don't need to have that choice boom chicka boom all right I'm gonna say boom chicka boom off there you have it okay so what you should see is your your data the first six lines of your data if you want to you can modify this up here and do tail of focal and what you should see is the last six lines since each of you guys were doing 12 individuals there should be 48 lines of data because there are four of you 12 individuals sampled per student so you can check both that your your data set looks correct, but you can also tell that it's complete. So the next thing that I have in here is getting the structure. STR is just a command that tells you what the structure of your data frame is, because you gave me some raw data, and then after I got that raw data, I did some things to it. So let's look at the structure of this file. We have your name, the investigator, they're just in here by, by last name. So Mason is first, Alexander, 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 Alexander. Then it goes Sanchez, then it goes Sawyer, then it goes Wilson. Uh, the group size, we categorize them as either small, medium, or large. Now, one person small was different than another person small, but you all kind of were shooting for smallish, mediumish, and, and large-ish groups. And then we actually have the actual group size. And so the number of the animal in your group, so we have six small six animals that were looked at from the small grouping, animal one, animal two, animal three, animal four, animal one, two, three, and four from the medium, and then um, et cetera. So uh, then we have head up, standing still, head up, walking, head down, feeding, head down, non-feeding, and sleeping. We have the total, in this case, this is the total number of seconds. But then I've added a bunch of columns in the data file that weren't in the data file because all of you have slightly different timestamps because you went beyond the five minutes in some cases because your animal was still behaving. And so what we did, what I did was I basically calculated what's the percentage of the total time that you reported. So I calculated what the total time was. So in this case, you went for five minutes exactly uh, here you went 287, 297, 252 for whatever reason. Um, and so I divided the observed number of seconds in head up, standing still, by the total number of seconds to get a percentage. How much time did you spend in, in total in head up, standing still? How much in head up, walking, et cetera, et cetera? And so these are all percentages if they have a P behind them. So head up walking percentage, head down feeding percentage, head down non-feeding percentage, and sleeping percentage. And then the total percentage should sum to 100 if I've done my calculations right. So I always have those kinds of checks in there. And then because head up standing still is really the only behavior that is strictly vigilance, I have the proportion that is vigilant, which is, should just be the same as the head up standing still percentage, and then percentage, percentage not vigilant is the rest, and once again, 38 and 62 should add to 100. Um, so we have a bunch of additional columns that we are interested in, in looking at. So you need the columns group size and PV. PV is the percentage of the time spent in vigilance, which would be heads up standing, head up standing still. And we want to just run a regression of the percentage of head up standing still. So remember that a regression, in this case, it's going to be group size on the x-axis and percent head up standing still 
on the y-axis from 0 to 100, and this is from small groups to large groups. And the hypothesis that group size affects vigilance would indicate that if you're in a small group, should you be spending a lot of your time in vigilance or very little of your time in vigilance in small groups? You should be spending a lot of time in vigilance, and if you're in a large group, you should be spending less time because you're dividing that effort up across a, a much broader group of individuals. And so you might something expect something that's curved or a straight line, but in any case, the slope is negative. And so regression analysis does a couple of things for us. It will tell us whether the slope is it different from zero or not? And that's what the significance test actually tests. But then it will also tell us the equation for the best fit line. And it will also give us an R square value, which is kind of how spread out the data are around the line. More formally, R squared can be thought of as the degree to which variation in the x variable explains variation in the y variable. So, group size varies, how well does that group size explain variation in percentage of the time spent in vigilance? If this does a really good job of explaining that, we're going to expect to see a tight cluster of points around that line. If group size isn't very good at explaining percentage of, of um, time spent in vigilance, then the, the spread of the points around that line is going to be very wide. So this varies from 0 to 1. 0 meaning that group size doesn't tell you anything about vigilance. And 1 meaning that group size tells you everything there is to know about vigilance. Okay. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to be looking for. So in this syntax, I'm saving the analysis as an object. So I can just type it in and pull it up anytime I want. And it's simply a linear model, that's what the LM is for, where percent vigilance is the y -ax, is the y variable, group size is the x variable, and the data that we're relying on are the data frame focal. So we run that, and it doesn't do anything down here because it's just saving that analysis as focal analysis. We can ask for it by typing in focal analysis, and what it does is it gives you the formula. In this case, the percent vigilance is equal to the y-intercept is 39.247. Oh, that's minus the slope, which is 0.008592. times group size. This is the actual equation of the line. And as you can see, this slope value is tiny. What that probably tells you is that this is probably not a significant relationship. Well, we can look at that by getting the summary. So just type summary in front of focal analysis, and it'll give you a little more detail. The thing that you want to know is you want to look at the statistical test. So where it says group size, it gives you the slope. It's the same slope value that we got on the last output. But over on the far right hand side, it gives you the p-value. So this slope, you're testing to see if the slope is significantly different from a slope of zero. This slope is very, very close to a slope of zero. So chances are it's not different from a slope of zero. And it's not different from a slope of zero because the p-value is 0.944. Remember that what the p-value is, is it's your observed type 1 error rate. 
type 1 error in regression is saying that a slope is different from zero when in actuality it's not. So you could say that the slope of negative point zero zero eight is different from zero, but you would have a 94% chance of being wrong. So this is about as non-significant a slope as you could possibly imagine. Totally non-significant would be one, and we're almost there. So what that tells you is these things are not related. It also gives you an R-square value here. The R-square value is 0 0.0001. Point zero 0.01 is 1%. One so this is 1,000th of 1%. So does group size tell you much? Does the variation in group size tell you much about the variation in vigilance? No. Variation in X explains about 1,000th of 1% 1 of the variation vigilance. It doesn't tell you anything. It's really snowing out there. Yeah. Those are like two. Hmm? Those are like two. So that's why it's useful to see the, the, the R square value is because it tells you something. Yeah. Sorry, one more time. What does the R square value tell you? It tells you the degree to which variation in the X variable explains variation in the Y variable. And in this case it doesn't explain anything. If you were a field biologist and we were a recruiter and we were doing analysis over beers, we would say it doesn't explain jack shit about vigilance. <laughs> like it's just it's just useless as a as a predictor of vigilance. So I've written down here this is clearly not significant and the R square value is practically zero. <laughs> not good. And so what, what would a relationship that, that satisfies all of those things look like if you graphed it? It would be a straight line with a big cluster of random points around it. So we're going to make a graph of the data. First thing you want to do is make a graphing block, a formatting block. I always format my graphs the same so that all the graphs in a presentation look the same. So I'll put at the beginning of my script, I'll put a, a standard format. The other thing about it is that if I ever want to then tweak something, I only have to tweak it once, rerun this, and then that populates through all the other graphs in the, in the script. So that's what I'm doing here. And then this is a plot. This is a little plotting group. You see that I called this formatting block TH for theme. And Rather than typing all of this in here every time I make a graph, I just put th in there and it just saves me a bunch of typing and all of the, all of the keystroke errors that I have when I type. So what this plot does is it basically asks you, it basically is saying, I want to make a plot. I want to use the data that are in focal. I want the x variable to be group size. I want the y variable to be PV. I want to plot a linear model through the cluster of points. That's what GeomSmooth is. I want you to show me the actual data points, but I want you to make them circular. That's what Shape 21 is. And Shape 21 also gives you an edge color and a fill color. I want you to make the dots size three, and I want the edge to be a certain thickness. So these are just formatting issues. I want you to put a Y label on the graph, which is time and vigilance as a percentage. And I want you to put an X label on the figure. And I want you to use these theme, these formatting instructions from up above. And when you do that, you get this. This is exactly what you expect, should expect out of a regression that you run that is not significant at a really high level of not significant, where x doesn't tell you anything 
of Alvois, you get a shotgun blast of points, and that slope is flat. It is not different from a slope of zero, which we kind of already suspected anyway. Okay, so in this case, according to your data, um, there's no relationship between vigilance and group size. So we can think about some of the reasons that this might be. Your data are very variable. Not only that, your maximum group size is 125. And in the 125, we have two points that are down here around 25%. But then we have two points up here that are 63 and 75%. That's pulling that end of that graph upwards. And so maybe one of the things that we need are either larger group sizes, maybe, maybe the scale of group size that we needed to be sampling across is actually wider than the scale of sampling that we actually looked at. Or it could just be that there is no relationship between these two variables. So um, that is it. And you'll see that, that all of these things occur on vertical lines. These are all vertical lines. Each vertical line has four observations in it because each person had different group sizes and each person looked at four individuals. So um, that is what the focal sampling showed. I have seen other data from other people who have done this lab as part of their, their project, and they have seen this, this downward trend in slope. Oftentimes it is, it is curvilinear, and so it doesn't, doesn't go down in a straight line, it goes down rather steeply and then kind of flattens out. So this figure reinforces the findings of the test of the regression. So we can now proceed to the scan sampling data. We're going to do the same thing. So those of you who had path problems, you need to copy the path from above and plug it in here so that it will go and find your data. Mine is going to do it automatically because the project seems to be working on my computer better than it's working on your computer. Run the head of the data file so that you see that it actually read it incorrectly. And we don't need to run structure because the structure of this file is the same as the structure of the other file in terms of the columns. What changes is the rows. In this case, each of you only have three rows, so we only have 12 data points because you have one aggregate measure for small group size, medium group size, and large group size. So as you can see, Mason has small, medium, large. He only has one of each. His sizes were 6, 20, and 80. Uh, Avery's were 6, 23, and 52, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, yeah. Ah, uh, you still have focal in there. Yeah. yeah. All right, check and make sure that... Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so now we're just going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to run a regression, we're going to look at the output, and then we're going to make a graph of it. So this is the regression. It's the same that we had before, except that I changed the name of it, so this is now scan analysis. And instead of the uh, data file is focal, now the data file is scan. So once you've done something in R, it's easy to do that same thing again. You just change the variables. So run that. You get the result. In this case, the slope is slightly stronger. It's negative 0.1 instead of negative 0.008. So it's, it's a stronger relationship. But let's test its significance. And what we find is that it's still not significant because now the p-value is 0.429. And the r-square value is higher, but it's still pretty darn close to zero. A group size doesn't tell you anything. Now, in this case, the y variable is the frequency of vigilant behaviors, not the time spent in vigilance, but the frequency of those behaviors because you just counted up the number of times you saw individuals head up standing still. 
And so the R square value is close to zero. The P value is not smaller than 0.05, so it's not significantly, it's not a slope that is significantly different from zero. And so once again, what should we expect to see out of this when we go to graph it? We should once again see a straightish line with a slight negative slope, but not much of a negative slope with a bunch of shotgun blast points around it. So same thing, we just change the data frame that we're using. We change what the Y variable is, is listed as because this is now the instances of vigilance expressed as a percentage. And then the X value, the X label is still the same because the group size is still on the X label. And what we get is, of course, what we thought we would get, which is a not very slopey line. But around that not very slopey line, there's a huge amount of variation. And that's why you can't tell, you can't distinguish that slope from a slope of zero. One of the ways of thinking about how the test operates is if you went to average group size, which is going to be somewhere down here because we have a cluster of points that are low and we have fewer points that are, that are high. But if the average is somewhere in here, if we put a fulcrum there and made this into a teeter-totter, if you teeter-tot this to flat, is it still inside of this confidence interval band? And if you can do that, then that's not different from a slope of zero. If you teeter-totter that and make it flat and it leaves that confidence interval band, then you have a slope that is different from a slope of zero. So that's kind of an intuitive way of thinking about um, thinking about the slope and whether it's different from a slope to zero. So this is what your data showed. Now, this is not what we expect. Because what we would expect is that one of the advantages of living in a group is that you don't have to spend as much time in vigilance as you would if you lived by yourself. Remember me talking about the, the geese, the two geese at the, at the Starbucks and sat there for three minutes and for the full three minutes, one of them was in head up standing still the whole time while the other one fed. So um, theory predicts that this should be a negative relationship. And it should be a negative relationship on both of these both of these counts. But you didn't find a negative relationship. The reason that there should be a reason for group size, so, sorry, let me rephrase that. The reason that we think that group size has the benefit of decreasing the amount of time that you have to spend on vigilance versus doing other things is that being in a group has other kinds of costs. If you're in a group of organisms, what are costs of being in a group? You have to share food. You have to share food. That's, that's an easy first thing. Like if you're in a group of 20 individuals, you have to share the food there with the other 19 individuals. If you're alone, you have all that resource to yourself. So in groups, competition goes up. And competition goes up with each new individual that you add to it. That's adding another person sucking down those resources. So if you're going to incur the cost of competition, you need to have a pretty good reason for hanging out in a group versus hanging out by yourself. One of the reasons that, that behavioral ecologists think that group size, that, that group living evolved was that decreases in predation rate actually counteract the costs of competition for resources. And so the question that you have to grapple with in this, in this lab report is, why do we not see a difference? So if you go online and you look for goose vigilance, you will actually find a surprising number of papers that have done a study very similar to what you guys did. If you type in meerkat vigilance, you will also find a surprising number of papers that have looked at meerkats. Meerkats live in social groupings and they have guards that hang out and, and do alarm calls and things like this. Um, and so there are a number of studies that have been done in other groups of, of group living organisms 
that have looked at this relationship between group size and vigilance. And so one of the things that you need to do is um, go and look at some of those papers. Most of them will have found a relationship. Some of them might not have and explore what the rationales are for what, what might be going on in a system when you don't see this correlation. Uh, where did you guys do all your work? Okay, in Liberty? That might have an effect potentially, simply because birds in general are more active during the morning. I, I said during lab it'd be best to do this in the morning, but if you couldn't, then, then obviously you couldn't. Uh, when did you guys do yours? Um, around like 10 to 1. 10 to 1, okay, so that's all later in the day. Avery? Oh, same, same time, okay. Yeah, so this could also just be a time of day effect. Uh, as well. The other thing, if you guys were doing stuff down at the ballpark and around Liberty, those animals are much more accustomed to human disturbance, and so they might just be um, acclimated to disturbance such that they are less vigilant because many of the things that would have caused them to be vigilant either aren't around in that there aren't a bunch of predatory birds hanging around in urban environments or suburban environments, or it could be that they just don't see those things as potential threats because they see large mammals and birds and stuff flying around that don't ever come and, and harass them and, um, and pose any actual real threat. And so they may actually be desensitized to threat as a result of being desensitized to threat, they might just be less vigilant, which works fine for them when they're hanging out in Liberty, doesn't work so fine for them if they fly out of town somewhere. So I will put together some expectations for the paper. The expectations are a little different because of the way the data turned out. And because I'm gonna ask you to go and read some more papers that I would maybe ask you to read as a result of the data turning out the way they did, um, probably gonna give you a little more time to get this, get this written because you're gonna to have to do some more reading uh, than you might normally do. I'm thinking about three weeks. Yeah, I'll, I'll get that back to you before then. Oh, yeah, I meant to bring those up. They're in my office. I forgot to bring them up because I just grabbed my computer. Uh, let me run down and get them. Yep. You guys all did pretty well. I mean, you all did amazingly consistent. Before I do that and get us distracted, do you have any other questions about this? Three, and are we just going to do this What's that? Are we confirmed on a three weeks time? Yeah, I'll do three weeks. Yeah. So the tenth. Mm -hmm. The tenth. Is that three weeks? Well, it was originally due on the twenty-second, I think. But the, okay. the oh. twenty-second. Yeah, we're behind because of. So. Today, one, two, three, or. Or the tenth. Yeah, it'll be the tenth. Yeah. The tenth. Other questions about this before we divert our attention? Mm -hmm. Will you bring a flash drive too? I'll bring, I'll bring a flash drive if I have one. You might be in my other bag because I've been sometimes walking to work, I change the bag.
what is good means for Paul? Does that mean we all got A's or does that mean we all got C's? Do you skip to I don't know. I don't really get on Did you bathe your cows? I did too. I was like, this is Paul's test and I can really get into it. Yeah, because I feel like we all felt okay. Yeah, but that's what I felt with Laura too. And he was like, well, I don't this specific thing. So I was like, ah. <laughs> See, I thought that was kind of like redundant. Yeah, Laura and Dan, why would you put you have a right? Literally everything you've ever learned ever. Yeah, I know. I did not like Laura. It was pretty good. I thought you were really good at the final. John put a hell of a screw us over on our exams last semester. I don't know. I don't like it. I don't know, Dr. Jones, but yeah, last year, last semester was right now. I don't we, even remember if that's fine. I think that's like, yeah. We I mean, we like had it for ecology, yeah. and there was one test. He was like, this will take you like less than an hour. Kelsey and I were doing it for like four hours. Yeah, and then we were like, like good in there, and be like, yeah, what is this? <laughs> You guys are very tight together, grade-wise, as a class, which doesn't surprise me. I gave you a, what? <laughs> no, I don't think so. What? I said we're all smart. Well, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so I gave you a pretest at the beginning of the semester. You guys were also all very tight, clustered together in the pretest. 348s and a 46 in terms of percentage. And I realize you're thinking, man, I only did like that on the pretest. But the pretest tested you over some things we cover in this class that you've seen in other classes, which is why you did so well on the pretest. But then a bunch of other stuff that you've never seen before. None of you knew about the marginal value theorem, ideal free distribution, et cetera, et cetera. So three of you had 48, and one of you had a 46. I'm like, wow, that's just really tight clustering. When I went and looked at the questions that you got correct, those were all things that you've seen in some other class that you've had. And that's a good thing because it shows that you're retaining information over the course of your four years. And so I expect to see a big improvement on the post-test simply because most of the things that you missed on the post-test or on the pre-test were things that you couldn't possibly be expected to know about because you haven't yet had a course in animal behavior. In our department chair yesterday, in our department meeting yesterday, we were talking about the utility of pretests and posttests in assessing not only learning gains within a class, but also in terms of assessing kind of progress made across the four years. And what we don't ever tell you is that when you are in evolution ecology and we give you a pretest. The class is somewhere around here on average. Now you guys are somewhere up here in terms of the, the pretest scores. And so one of the things that we should see over the course of a program as we're kind of looking at how we're doing at teaching you over the course of the program, is if you start out here as a first year student, the gains that you make, there's going to be a huge gap between what your pre test score is and perhaps what your post test score is. You know, maybe a difference of 40 percentage points. But as you get older, you have more courses under your belt, you see the same topics introduced early on and then reinforced later, you actually see a smaller gap, and let's say maybe in this case 30 points, in later classes between pre-test and post-test because you already started out higher. So one of the things that we want to see as we look at pre-post-test results from the first year, from the second year, from the third year, is we expect that gap between pre and post tests to be narrow over time. And I expect we're going to see that with you. Your, your gap between pre and post is probably going to be narrower than your gap was when you were a first year student. 
And that's, that's good. That said, you guys are all knocking on the B door. Everybody in class, and you're all fairly tightly clustered, just like you were on the pretest. So, I sincerely expect on the next test, you guys will probably all be knocking on the A door because you've been through one of this style of test. And I fully expect this is going to be one of those semesters when I should be able to just fill in A's for the class at the end of the semester because that's what you will have earned. And I'm perfectly fine with that. I do not grade on a curve when grades are low. And I do not grade on a curve when grades are high. You prove what you know by taking tests. You prove what you know and can do by writing lab reports, et cetera, et cetera. If you prove that you've mastered the material in the class, you get an A. So I know you guys, I know what you're capable of. No reason why you guys all can't be walking out of here with A's. You're already on the path to doing that. So questions. Grade is on the last page. All right, if there are no questions, then we're done. I'll put a key, I've, I've got a digital version of the key already made out. I'll post that to Moodle so you can see what answers I was looking for. Although on most of your papers, if I mark something wrong, I usually wrote a little explanation as to why I marked it that way. So 